primary research interest. He's board certified in both internal medicine and critical care medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine. His primary clinical focus is on managing critical ill patients in complex medical cases that require life supportive measures, mainly acute mechanical support devices like ECMO. Uh, also, also interested in clinical research related to management of ECMO, short term and long term outcomes. Um, I love I love that uh, Akram Zokok is focusing his research in the field of inflama, inflammation with multiple multiple research projects related to sepsis, trauma, and hemorrhagic shock, the essence of uh, our profession, right? Uh, extracorporeal perfusion um, and the body and ECMO as a therapy for these pathologies. Akram is is one of PDC's physician consultants in conjunction with Dr. Keith Scott of LSU and helping me teach ECMO to many multiple centers out there. His presentation today is on that evasive and still haunting subject of anticoagulation entitled The Conundrum of Bleeding and Thrombosis in Extracorporeal Membrane Oxygenation. My friend, Dr. Uh, Akram Zaykhok, and he can pronounce the name better than I am. I, I do it better when I'm not online like this, actually. Um, just to note, though, after his uh, lecture, we will have lunch and there will be a presentation, a 10 minute presentation at that time at 1240. So uh, Akram, for me right away, pronounce your whole name the way it's supposed to be pronounced, because I think I muddled it pretty badly. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for uh, the organizing committee to give me a chance to present. My name is Akram Zakouk, and uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, this topic for me it has um, a special interest because um, it is related to the field of inflammation, and it's also related to ECMO. So two passions, hope I'm able to combine both together um, in this topic. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, so just for the disclosures, um, I do some uh, medical consultant work for ECMO and I'm a speaker for EpiMed, uh, in addition to my role here in MedStar uh, Washington Hospital Center. Um, a brief introduction. So as we all know and happy to learn that there has been um, increase in ECMO use um, worldwide including for both cardiac and for um, ERDS respiratory support. And yet there is um, one of the major complications or downsides that we see with this um, amazing technology is the hemorrhage and um, thrombotic events that can happen. And for all the audience, and you guys know this better than me, uh, there are huge differences between ECMO and um, cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, just to emphasize what, what you guys do in the OR, where you put a patient on bypass for a short period of time, you drive the anticoagulation up with high doses of heparin, and there is a component of um, hemodilution, hypothermia, it's more like an open circuit, and there is no positivity. Um, and towards the end of the case, of course, the administration of the protamine sulfate. On ECMO, on the other hand, it is a longer time on the machine. We use low-dose heparin. We do not use reversal agent. And um, there is no hypothermia. There is minimal or no, no um, air um, interface because it's closed system. And the positivity depends on what kind of ECMO and what's the underlying disease of the patient. So in my talk, I'm going to touch base on the normal physiology first and then highlighting the differences um, that associated with ECMO. And then we will talk about management of anticoagulation and we will go into some uh, future directions where we're heading with this technology. So for the hemostasis, um, as we know, it's all, it's very tightly regulated process, aiming to keep the blood flowing smoothly through our, uh, throughout our blood vessels. And if there is any degree of damage, 
there is the activation of the system to control that damage and close um, any damage, any, any leak in the blood vessel. So closes of the damage, keep the blood flowing in fluid state. If there is any clot forms to dissolve that clot to restore the vascular integrity. So the first, the, in the top um, diagram here, this is the normal person, that's all of us, where we have this state, we are balanced between pro-thrombotic and anti-thrombotic stage. In matter of fact, we are leaning more towards um, anti-thrombotic state to keep the blood flowing, um, as I mentioned. And once this balance get disturbed, as you can see in the diagram below, we either swing in the direction of prothrombosis, formation of clot, or um, antithrombosis and bleeding and hemorrhage. So this titan process, um, it's based on molecular uh, components that exist in our blood vessels and balance the state. And what I'm showing you here is the normal coagulation cascade once there is a damage in the blood vessel where the release of the tissue factor, that will activate factor seven, factor 10, and then thrombin um, and fibrin that forms the clot that closes you know, any gap. And in the same time, we have also a negative control for this pathway, which depends heavily on the intact endothelium with activation of the protein C, protein S, and those component um, in, um, in, um, strengthen the effect of the anti-thrombin and prevent any clot from formation. That's why in the normal state, normally there is no um, clot in the system. There are two components, cellular components that are really extremely important for the cascade system, the intact endothelium and the platelets. The intact endothelium with the presence of von Willebrand factor and the presence of tissue factor inhibitors and the interaction with um, the um, protein C and protein S and other uh, markers such as nitric oxide released from the normal intact endothelium um, prevent clot formation. And the platelets by itself, it's very sensitive, highly specialized um, system um, that once detect any vascular damage, um, respond by the aggregation um, and uh, release of more factors and activation of the coagulation system to control that you know, process. But not only that, the platelet has a huge role in the hemostasis, uh, but also has a huge role in the immunity. And that's why the endothelium and the platelet has a major role in the immune system. For instance, if there is any um, inflammatory process happened in the body with the activation of the white blood cells, but its turn release um, cytokines and inflammatory mediators that triggers the platelets and activate the platelets. And by itself, the platelets become a full positive feedback loop that initiate and potentiate the inflammation more and at the same time can activate the coagulation system. And that's why in severe inflammatory state, as you guys see these days with a COVID um, infection, uh, we start seeing a higher incidence of clot or bleeding. And in this table here, that will show you just the number of the factors that interact with the platelets. And as you can see, in addition to the coagulation factors, the complements, uh, there are a lot of chemokines and there is a lot of uh, cytokines get released. 
uh, from the body that interact with with this um, organelle. Sorry, with this um, um, blood component. So what happened in ECMO? So the ECMO by itself induces a degree of um, inflammation. Why? Because once the blood passes on um, a surface or um, the ECMO, in the ECMO circuit that is not, um, it has any endothelium in it, immediately the inflammatory system start getting triggered um, and there is activation of the clotting and the platelets and also activation of the fibrinolysis process. This is just with the initial contact between the blood and between the ECMO circuit. But also the reason why those, why the patient end up on ECMO has a role because majority of the patients, um, when they end up on ECMO, they already has underlying uh, pathology that trigger inflammation, either a degree of myocardial damage or um, severe ERDS or any other component. So it's um, a vicious cycle between the etiology for placing patient on ECMO that's probably trigger the inflammation. And in the same time, the exposure of the blood to the inflammatory to the foreign um, ECMO circuit trigger the inflammation more. So it becomes like a positive feedback loop. And this is essentially like what I'm saying about the, the once we lose the endothelium, run over the ECMO circuit, that will exacerbate the inflammation. And the exacerbation of the inflammation with the activation of the coagulation system can run into a consumptive coagulopathy that can precipitate the patient to more clot or um, bleeding, and sometimes like DIC. Um, and this is another diagram shows you what happens when we lose the endothelial coverage and how that will activate um, the um, tumor necrosis factor into leukin one beta and uh, coagulation system with a complement system. In this study, it shows that if we compare patients who had been put on ECMO versus control, we'll find there is a significant depletion of the bone Willebrand factor because of the loss of the endothelial surface. And that by itself will predispose patients to clotting formation or, or bleeding. So to overcome that issue, uh, we have majority of our ECMO circuits now like heparin coated material to prevent this process from happening to some extent. But it yet we have further things we can do in the future to address that issue. Um, and once, as I said, once the patient gets put on ECMO, there is complete disturbance of the coagulation profile, as you can see in these diagrams that actually they use three different ECMO systems and in, both, in all the three of them, you can see the disturbance in the coagulation factors um, and the D-dimer. So clot formation, in this retrospective analysis, clot formation um, and um, changing in the circuit was a major component um, um, and major complication for an ECMO. Hence, that topic need to be addressed more. So in those few slides, I'm going to touch uh, based on what we know so far when it comes to um, the ELSO guidelines. Uh, so correcting coagulopathy prior to ECMO initiation um, is um, recommended. Giving bullous heparin during the time of coagulation, as we all do, and heparin continuous infusion during ECMO support aiming for um, ACT 180 to 120 per second and adjusting the dose according to the clinical context. Uh, consider the individual approach to a patient and have more than one method of anticoagulation per institution um, is um, 
um, a strong uh, recommendation from ANSO. The anti-thrombin-3 activity uh, is suggested to replace if it is less than 50% and if the patient is not responding to um, high-dose heparin. Um, and considering TAG in conjunction with other methods of assessment. Um, some recommendations about using the anti-TNA, it's specific to heparin, as I'm going to mention to you in, in a few seconds, and the target 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. Um, and this is the alternative about the direct um, thrombin inhibitor. Um, it has many advantages, but one of the uh, major disadvantage is that there is no reversal agent uh, for um, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor. Divining bleeding threshold and transfuse uh, blood products as needed. So this is our local protocol here at um, the, the hospital where we use um, goal uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 um, for uh, major majority of our um, ECMO patients. And we are using very tight titration uh, for the anticoagulation. But also we have an alternative where we use anti TNA 0.1 to 0.3. And this is mainly for patients who are at high risk for bleeding, um, such as post-cardiotomy patients or bad patients. So activated, um, is activated clotting time, as you guys know, it is a whole blood test. And um, it, it's not just reflective of the heparin function, it's reflective of many other functions, including the platelet function, if there is hypofibrogenemia or any coagulation factor abnormality. The biggest challenge with um, activated clotting time is an ECMO and there are multiple studies actually shows that with a low dose of anticoagulation that we use on ECMO, the ACT might start losing it is sensitivity. As you can see here in this study where they compare three different ranges of the ACT and um, with a low ranges of ACT, the ACT lose its sensitivity. But yet it has the advantage of it's a bedside test. And actually majority of the institutions based on this um, survey, up until now, they still use the ECT as the main um, anticoagulant with ranges between um, 160 to 200 and fewer institutions, um, they go to the range between 180 to 210, 220. The PTT is a plasma test, and the way it, it gets assessed is usually by either clot formation or mechanical uh, clot detection um, over time. Um, and it is um, mainly directed towards the intrinsic pathway of the coagulation, and can also affected by fibrinogen and by factor eight level. Factor 10, um, is a direct measurement, anti-factor 10 um, is a direct measurement of the heparin inhibition, um, but the tests get affected by um, hyperpolyrubinemia and high plasma-free hemoglobin because it's based on the optic density measurement of on the blood. Um, the last one is the tag and the tag provide a lot of information, including the platelet function, the clot um, strength and firmness, and the fibrinolysis. So, so far for all these tests, um, I mentioned to you so far, um, as you can see, each test has its own limitation and has its own advantages and disadvantages. And as long as the institution or the local institution, they understand these um, limitations and they can function, they can function accordingly. We'll show you a couple of studies that compare different um, methods of anticoagulation 
Um, so in this paper, um, they compared the tag for anticoagulation guidance um, versus um, the the versus the PTT. And what we found, what they found, they found actually the results are very close. Um, in matter of fact, actually, TAG might be better in detection of uh, hypercoagulable state than other factors. So it is feasible and it is safe to be used. Um, there is the antithrombin-3. There are multiple factors also um, inhibit. It's a reversible inhibition of multiple clotting factors. And, then, and that's how the heparin work by activation of the antithrombin-3 uh, enhances activity. So if there is anti-inflammatory state, um, the, the antithrombin-3 might get depleted you know, in, some, in, some, in some patients. And in this paper, they measured the um, administration of fresh frozen plasma in patients with heparin resistant in comparison, and they found it actually decreases dramatically the dose um, of heparin in those 42 VA ECMO patients. So I mentioned that the heparin is the mainstay of anticoagulation. It works by activation of antithrombin-3. If there is an antithrombin-3 um, resistant, so then we can consider replacement of the antithrombin or give fresh frozen plasma for those patients. But we have other direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, which including the Argatruban. And in this paper was a retrospective analysis of 500, more than 500 patients who are in ECMO. Um, 39 received Argatruban, 39 patients just matched by heparin as a control. And both groups has comparable results when it comes to thrombotic events and bleeding. What about bivalurudin? The same, there was also studies used um, bivalurudin uh, for anticoagulation. And in those studies, um, it's 28 patients in the heparin group, 44 patients in bivalurudin group. And if you look into, into the differences in the anticoagulation characteristics or you know, any major bleeding or any vascular complication was almost comparable between both groups. This paper just came out uh, in the critical care medicine where they compared the um, bivalurudin to heparin and its retrospective study came from University of Pittsburgh. And what they found, they found bivalurudin um, reduces the, they have less incidence of bleeding, um, clot formation, um, oxygenator failure, and platelet transfusion. So in this paper, they suggest that bivalurudin might have an added um, advantage over using just heparin. But it remained, it was a retrospective analysis um, and need to be validated more. So this table just summarize, you know, what we're using so far for anticoagulation between unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin and direct thrombin inhibitors and the antiplatelet drugs also that we don't have yet sufficient data on it. But I think, you know, with us experiencing more of um, COVID with um, platelet um, activation, this will be a topic of interest uh, to address and study. Now, we talked about the heparin coding of the um, ECMO circuit and the whole idea uh, that will um, potentiate the, um, um, the antithrombin and reduce the incidence of the clot formation in the, in the ECMO circuit. And these are like a table that shows you all the available materials that has been used uh, for coating of the um, um, ECMO circuits and different technology. Um, and as you can see, 
this actually um, we're making very good progress in that aspect. This paper uh, it's under review right now, where we um, studied our local institutional experience, and we tried to see the incidence of the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia um, in, in, in our patients. And as you all know, um, that goes with the literature that the, the incidence of the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia uh, are very low, relatively low in the ECMO patients. But what's interesting in this, what we studied the serotonin assay and the optic density um, for uh, the ECMO patients. And what we found, we found using optic density more than 1.2 um, that correlate strongly uh, with um, accuracy of the test and the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. So just ordering anti antiplatelet antibody by ELISA is not enough. It's, it's important to have a serotonin assay to confirm, but also it's important to look at the optic density for the ELISA because that might hit, hint um, in the right direction. And of course, if there is an heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, um, usually the direct thrombin inhibitors are the mainstay anticoagulation for those patients. Um, just we'll touch base on um, those mainly for the pediatric population with the indication of plasma exchange on ECMO. And that happens frequently in patients with thrombocytopenia, especially if it's associated with um, organ failure. Um, it's, um, it has very limited use in the adults, um, to the best of my knowledge, but it's very interesting um, concept. So where are the future directions for us? First of all, the low-dose heparin. Can we use low-dose heparin versus the traditional anticoagulation? And in this um, pilot um, RCT, where you have 16 patients were in the heparin group and 16 patients in the therapeutic um, traditional anticoagulation group. As you can see from looking at the anti-TNA um, value, here is like between 0.07 to 0.18 versus uh, 0.17 to 0.42. It actually shows there is no differences in the um, incidence of clot formation or um, any incidence, difference in the incidence of bleeding. So from this survey, and it's, of course, we have to consider the number of the patients enrolled in this pilot study, um, that it appeared that the low-dose heparin um, could be comparative to the normal traditional anticoagulation goal. Um, and this, of course, has to be validated more. What about patients with no, if we run ECMO with no anticoagulation at all? Um, so this um, retrospective analysis from the group on, in Northwestern, um, they looked at the uh, 36 patients with no anticoagulation and 38 patients were on the anticoagulation group. And as you can see here, there was less incidence of bleeding, of course, in the anticoagulation three group. Um, and the incidence of oxygenator changes or um, oxygenator failure um, was also lower, as you can see. And then the blood transfusion was significantly less in the anticoagulation group. But now this group also have to consider the, um, this is um, mainly for uh, VV ECMO. And this is all, almost like for the um, lung transplant population, very ECMO uh, population. Um, in this, in this um, systematic review, um, they also report the safety of running ECMO with no anticoagulation. Uh, and uh, they emphasize you know, that fact, and that's something we could consider um, 
for the future. But even more interesting and more exciting, if we do like some sort of like surface uh, modification, um, mainly the component of intotalization of um, the ECMO circuit. And by using this intotalization, probably we don't need to be to anticoagulate the patient anymore. And um, we can run the ECMO um, for a long period of time. There is also advances in the, um, the surface um, of the ECMO circuit to become releasing, in addition to being heparin coded to become functional with releasing nitric oxide or releasing direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, so these are like all in under studies in um, vitro um, studies. Um, and in this table, we summarize all the component about, you know, the heparin um, coating and the nitric oxide release uh, and endothelization for those patients. What about bleeding on ECMO if it happens? So that's the usual paradigm. We try to control bleeding um, by using local agents um, and also um, if that bleeding continue uh, to transfuse the patient by correcting the platelet and fibrinogen, considering the systemic um, antifibrinolysis such as uh, TXA is safe on ECMO and it's been used, and the final result will be um, giving factor, competent factor for those patients. And I think that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Akram. First, I wanna thank Carla Mall, one of our panelists that uh, introduced us to each other some time back. And it was uh, with extreme pleasure that uh, after we had many discussions that you were able to join our company as a consultant, again, with Dr. Scott as well. So um, I, I appreciate that relationship going forward and uh, quite happy to have you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. The, um, well, the first question I have, and uh, we're, we have till, uh, uh, see, 1240 here um, to before we have our lunch, is that you mentioned there were a number of questions from the audience about using no, no anticoagulants on ECMO. And you had brought that up with that study from, I believe it was Northwestern in Chicago in that paper. Um, obviously, I think there would be a use for that. And of course, I've done it before uh, under physician uh, orders. But of course, there would be a reason for that if you uh, are uh, freshly out of the OR and we have a moderate to high uh, hemorrhagic situation going on. So, you know, we would want to turn our anticoagulant off um, regardless of which one we're using, whether it's a DTI or heparin at that time. Uh, my question is, what would be, why, what is the advantage of ter having no anticoagulation going on a non-bleeding patient um, when the possibility of clot formation, which we know does occur even at a micro uh, clotting uh, uh, situation, uh, what would be the advantage to going ahead and not using an anticoagulant? I'll wait for your uh, answer on that, and then I'll follow it up with a uh, with an opinion and a question as well. Thank you, Bill. Um, I mean, you're you're making a, a great point. Um, the the advantage is mainly for patients who are, um, as you mentioned, like very operative patients, or patients who are like trauma. You know that they end up on ECMO. And, you know, definitely it is safe, you know, to uh, not anticoagulate those patients. And the way I look at it is like, um, I think for us, you know, um, as, 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 as a team, we, we should um, have this in our um, toolbox, as you, as, as you would say, that we, is, we are not obligated to anticoagulate those patients at least like, you know, for the short term, if there is ongoing situation, you know, that would um, 
you, you know, compromise the, 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 the health of the patient. So it's risk versus benefit. So if the risk is very high, you know, it's, it's fine not to anticoagulate those patients. But as you mentioned, if the patient is completely fine, normal, and is not at bleeding risk, you know, uh, I agree with you. I think, you know, um, even what we've seen from some, um, you know, imaging of the brain, that sometimes there are undetected microemboli, you know, happened um, with those patients. So, so, so definitely, you know, I, I would anticoagulate. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I recently had a call from a center um, that was asking for a consultation and they had five circuits. And I think I mentioned this to you. I know I did because I asked you for some help as well. They had five circuits go out on them. The oxygen oxygenator, in other words, stopped functioning. And this was in the first one or two or three days. It was a COVID positive patient. Uh, and they were anticoagulating, but they were uh, using heparin at the time uh, and they were going to go on their sixth circuit and they were asking, you know, had I ever seen something like that? That's a hell of a lot of circuits to go through. Um, what was noticeable, what was not noticeable was actually clot formation through the transparency of the oxygenator housing. Uh, once we went through a couple of ideas about what, you know, what I might do, and uh, one was to go on heparin and DTIs, and, and I think your suggestion was to also put them on aspirin at about 325 milligrams daily, um, and uh, that, you know, that was a great, those were great suggestions. We then found out the patient had a fibrinogen level of greater than 700 um, during this time. Uh, so, uh, of course, you know, I think Dr. Scott had suggested possibly a plasma transfusion, um, uh, that might help as well. But fortunately with those first three, uh, suggestions, they were able to get through that sixth circuit and maintain, I guess my point is there was no visible clot, but there must've been fibrin deposition on the membrane. Uh, to cause the membrane to fail in such short periods of time. And I'm talking about five, uh, five membranes at that. So I kind of gave away the story, but if you have suggestions on that and why sometimes you can't just rely on looking, seeing clot through the uh, housing, the transparency of the housing. So um, do you have any um, thoughts on that? It would be very, um, <clears throat> would be very interesting from the uh, coagulation standpoint um, to see the, you know, how, how did the tab for, for those patients, you know, look like, you know, it might like, you know, help us more understanding, but the fact that you mentioned there was really high fibrinogen, um, it's reflective of very intense, you know, inflammatory response in that patient. Um, I'm sorry about, was this patient a COVID patient? My understanding was he, they were COVID positive. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's, um, you know, that's the challenge um, that we've seen, you know, with those, uh, with those patients. And sometimes even with the switching, the anticoagulation regimen, um, it's still like, you know, does, it doesn't work. And um, the suggestion from, you know, Dr. Scott, I found it um, very um, interesting and in the same time, you know, um, um, appropriate indication uh, because if you run through five circuits and you're still running into coagulation issue, plasma exchange would be, um, you know, a viable option at that time. Um, the, yeah, it's like, you know, it's one of those, you know, challenging, it's one of those challenging scenarios um, between, you know, um, direct frimpon inhibitor, you know, aspirin, plasma exchange, yeah, you know, there is, there is uh, nothing more can be done. A patient like this, actually, I'm thinking right now, um, I'm wondering if that institution, they had cytosorb um, available and they might just like consider, you know, sticking the cytosorb and see if that would make any difference. That's a good question. I'll do a follow up with them and, and, and find that out. Thank you. Um, 
has there ever been this is Ty Walker? Has there ever been any use of uh, GP two V three A's like uh, Agrostat uh, with the use of these patients and the benefit of that with combined anticoagulation? That's an excellent point. So definitely, the anti you know anti platelets. Um, has been used, you know, and like continuous infusions, um, you know, um, or even like oral agent, you know, um, we, we've used it, we've used it locally in our institution here, but we didn't use it for um, clot formation. It's more for patients who end up having um, stenting um, and then progress into cardiogenic shock, and then you know we're placed on uh, on ECMO. So we used to use this in conjunction with the heparin, you know, infusion. And you know, in my limited experience, we've done it almost like five patients here. We didn't see any increase in the risk of um, clot formations, you know, on those patients. So that's very interesting. Um, and I know, you know, in, in, the, in the literature, there was some, you know, mentioning about, you know, potential use of these drugs, you know, as future direction for anticoagulation, but I am not aware of um, an actual study that's, you know, compare this either as a single agent or combination with, um, and, um, with heparin um, on ECMO. Dr. Akram, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. I do have one question from Sean Devereaux, and he wants to know, without any anticoagulation, what is the lowest flow that you would go before termination of ECMO? So the lowest flow you can um, go, you're talking about off anticoagulation? Carla? No anticoagulation, correct. So the lowest we've done was like two and a half liters. You know, we didn't go below two and a half liters. Um, um, and that's actually that patient, uh, she was um, via ECMO um, and uh, she, um, she was probably via ECMO um, and we did not anticoagulate her because she had ongoing um, pulmonary edema and also a hemoptysis. Um, so that's the lowest we went to was two and a half liters. Um, me personally, like I would feel extremely uncomfortable like going below two and a half liters, you know, on, 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 on especially, you know, um, VA ECMO patients. I'm not sure about the group, um, you know, how, how comfortable they feel like um, and what is, uh, you know, the lower threshold, but that's, that's, that's my personal experience. This may be um, an interesting question, but kind of like cardioplegia circuits, there's a million of them out there. Do you see any benefit, and I, you might not want to answer this, but do you see any benefit as far as one circuit versus another circuit in your experience with ECLS patients? Um, is there, you know, you see where your outcomes are better because there's multiple circuits out there. Some now are approved for long-term use. Some are not, so. Thank you for this question, because, um, you know, we were running into some issues uh, related to that. Of course, there is no head-to-head -head study to, you know, to study which circuit versus the other. And, um, you know, one of the studies I showed during my presentation, you see, like, they compare three circuit, and it seems like the coagulation profile to all three were comparable. Um, but, um, you know, one of the devices that we are trialing, um, it was very interesting. We're seeing more, um, you know, pump issues and it is related to essentially the size, you know, of the pump head and um, the, um, you know, the amount of blood that goes into that pump head. Some, some of the equipments, they have like a smaller pump head 
and uh, you know require and they run at high RPMs, you know, to maintain the ECMO flow. And you know these devices, you know, apparently just you know we had like one case like this, you know, we had like some issues with a plot formation. Um, you know, versus some other, you know, um, equipments. Um, and I know some of the, even like as the devices get smaller and smaller in the technology, as you know, as we all know between like, you know, the friction, the amount of the flow and how fast the flow will go through the circuit, um, that will definitely cause a risk, you know, of um, clot formation. Um, in addition to consider like, you know, the heating that happens in the pump head as the blood cross through, um, if it run for a long period of time. But that's uh, that's that's an excellent that's an excellent question, Dr. Zaklock. This is Susan Ingler here. Very nice presentation. Thank you so much. I have a question here from Danny Salab. He says, if a patient was to need cardiopulmonary bypass, would you continue to use a bivalrudin? Or would you convert to heparin, assuming they're not on hit? So, if you say he's saying if the patient was on um, bivalrudin on the after, like his, they start bivalrudin after the bypass. I just want right. to be sure. If they needed to go on bypass cardiac right. surgery, would they? If they needed to go on bypass, would you keep them on? By Valrudin, or would you switch over to heparin, assuming they're not a hip patient? I, I would switch. I would switch to heparin. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason because the heparin is reversible, um, and uh, that's 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 a huge advantage, you know, for uh, for heparin. Um, and the other thing, you know, and what I learned from some of our perfusionists that it seems like you know by Valrudin especially on the cardiopulmonary bypass with, um, you know, air, blood interface and other, you know, issues like this, it has the tendency to polymerize and, you know, cause some issues. Um, so, you know, I think that's what I would do. I will, I will definitely switch to heparin. Thank you. Well, thank you, Akram. That was an uh, excellent presentation. Are you going to be able to join us for the panel discussion later on at uh, 1510 Eastern? Yes. Great. Yes. Well, we have a number of other questions from the audience that I'm trying to do screenshots and remember them. So uh, thank you again for your time. And again, excellent presentation. And I, some of your graphics, man, those were those were beautifully simplified compared to the old anticoagulation or coagulation cascades. I kind of understand it better now. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you.